Every year in America, over 11,000 babies die on the day that they're born. Most are just born too early, their vital organs, heart and lungs still unformed. Even those who survive beyond 24 hours often die before their first birthday. But if the baby is African-American, they are more than twice as likely to die. Fault Lines travels to Cleveland, Ohio to look at what's causing these deaths and to try to find out why the United States has the worst rate of infant mortality in the industrialized world. It's Monday morning in Cleveland's Metro Health Hospital. A newborn baby boy has just been rushed into the neonatal intensive care unit known as the NICU. Weighing just over two pounds, he's 14 weeks premature. It means he was only in the womb for less than six months. He's really retracting. Do you see his blood pressure? Very low. Well, they're right now trying to get urgent care to the baby that's just been born here literally within the last couple of hours. And right now getting respiration assistance and an intravenous drip inserted. This is the kind of scenario that happens all the time on this ward. Medical advances have dramatically improved the odds of survival for premature babies, but they haven't changed one aspect of this crisis. Almost all of the babies in this ward are black. Just under 40% of the babies who are born are African American. But they contribute to 70% of the babies who die in the first year of life. So you have this huge, huge disparity and that's kind of business as usual. It's been going on for decades. Baby Tyrione is just hours old, but he's on a life support machine. The nurses are worried about his chances of survival. Tyrione is so premature, he can't breathe without a machine pumping oxygen through his tiny lungs. It's an extreme measure for such a small baby. It puts him at high risk for infection and internal bleeding. He's helpless. It seems like he got a tube coming from everywhere. For Tyrion's mother, Lachey Welsh, it's an agonizing time. I really can't do anything but just stand by and watch and wait. And it's a long wait. But Lachey can't stay with him. A single mother with three other children her earnings keep the family just above the poverty line. My doctors have put me on light duty, and my job didn't honor the light duty. Our welfare is not enough to support me and my children, so I had to go back to work full duty. After working an overnight shift, finishing at 7 in the morning, Lachey started having contractions. She was rushed to hospital and gave birth but now she has to get back to work. I hate to say it this way, but I'm kind of glad that he did come now and that he's going to be in the hospital for the next couple of months so that I can work. So that's actually... Oxygen being pushed in. Yeah, certainly in waves. Even if a baby can be saved in a NICU, it's an outcome and a cost doctors say could be prevented. You're literally talking about several thousand dollars per day. So if you have a baby who's been in the hospital for eight months, the math is pretty easy. You're closing in on a million dollars of care just to get that baby home. 
If you could prevent one of those preemies, you save the system hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's why you know access to care and prenatal care is so vital. If you have to have a baby born prematurely, the United States is one of the best places in the world for that baby to be born. Our neonatal intensive care units are some of the best, if not the best in the world. That's not the point. Dr. Arthur James is one of the leading infant mortality experts in the United States. He says that the heart of the problem lies outside of the hospitals. Unfortunately, in this country, when we experience families who are in crisis, we generally throw everything in the kitchen sink at them to try to assist and help during that period of time. But we are not anywhere close to being that vigilant about trying to practice preventive medicine, about trying to keep families out of crisis. Everywhere you look in Cleveland, it seems those crises are playing out. Right here, the last one. Yep. In a corner of a public cemetery, 24-year-old Lene Earl is visiting the grave of her infant son, Jason. He died two weeks ago. The burial sites are marked with nothing more than wooden sticks, but each one represents a story of personal loss. It's just a number. And it just don't feel like people right here. Just a bunch of dirt. Each year, around 85 infants die within their first 12 months in Cleveland, a death rate that's growing even while the city's population is diminishing. This in the hospital? Yeah. I just wish that, like, the fear home where I would go. Because once that leaves, I think I might be better. Mm -hmm. That was the hardest part. Lene had given birth to twins who were more than three months premature. JC On's brother died within the first few hours. The surviving child spent time in intensive care before he was healthy enough to leave the hospital. Lene says everything was normal until one night when JC On was four months old. He stopped breathing in his sleep and died. I don't know what it was, but something felt wrong. And I woke up, and when I picked him up, it was just like nothing. The doctors told Lene it was sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, the third leading cause of infant death. It's like losing a piece of your heart, missing a piece of your soul, because my kids are my soul, my kids are my heart. Now, Lene is focused on raising her two-year-old daughter and six-year-old son. But she's finding it hard to overcome her loss. I go to school from nine to four, and I'm working seven days a week. I have no off day. It's like my mind is just cluttered with everything. Stress, everything. And I just feel so horrible because I wasn't able to protect my kids. And everybody say you're supposed to be able to protect your kid as a parent. But I, I feel like I failed. Cases like Lene's are all too common in Cleveland. So what is it that's causing so many babies to die here in the city? Why are those babies predominantly African-American? And what's being done to try to stop it? The reasons for infant mortality are complex, but what everyone agrees is that poverty plays a part. The rates are worst in the cities of the South and the Rust Belt, with their legacies of economic collapse and racial division. And one of the hardest hit cities is Cleveland. Here, the unemployment rate for whites is around 6%. For African Americans, that number is almost three times higher. Like many cities across America, the sight of boarded up businesses and devastated neighborhoods is something that's become increasingly common. But what's remarkable about Cleveland is that it also happens to be the worst city in the entire United States for infant mortality. 
In Cleveland, there are neighborhoods where the infant mortality rate is worse than that of countries like Guatemala, Botswana, and even North Korea. Eric Price is a lifelong Cleveland resident. He says the scale of the problem is the product of living in a forgotten city. It used to be a great area. It was great for bringing up kids. It was great educationally. It was a middle class, typical middle class, Midwestern neighborhood. Eric remembers these neighborhoods as prosperous places when transport, oil and steel drove the city's economy. But now there are no jobs. Of course, there's no money. They even start tearing down schools. They didn't care about our educational systems. They didn't care about our health care. You know, I know parents who struggle to feed their kids on a daily basis. We literally have nothing. With the collapse of those communities have come soaring rates of infant mortality, factors that social historians of the city say are inextricably entwined. Sometimes we want to deal with just the medical piece, which is really important, right? Because people are dying, babies are dying. But we also have to then look at what is feeding that continuously. And if people don't have access to good housing, if they don't have access to healthy food, if they don't have access to money to buy food, all of those things, then we're going to continue to see these kinds of statistics. 21-year-old Ariel Smith is homeless, unemployed, and eight months pregnant with her first child. The father of her unborn baby was sent to prison two months ago. She's been struggling to get by ever since. The situation that I'm in is not a situation for anybody pregnant to be in. To be homeless and then to have a child on the way is just the worst situation that I feel like I could possibly be in. Ariel has known hardship her entire life she was raised in foster care, and she says her baby will be the only real family she has ever known. I feel like I don't have anybody. My son, that's gonna be my heart. Like, you know, he gonna be everything to me. Like, and that's somebody that I'm gonna love unconditionally, no matter what. Ariel's only support is Charles Retta Wynn, a community health worker. Charles Retta works for a program called Moms First that supports new and expecting mothers in Cleveland's toughest neighborhoods. Well, yeah, when I got hired, I was just supposed to provide the women with information and support, refer them to an organization that could help them get some of the things they need for their babies, because a lot of babies were dying in this neighborhood. But over the years, Charles Retta has been doing a lot more than just offering health advice. And this is the first chance she had to get. She spends most of her time helping women navigate what she says is a broken welfare system. I need people to work with me, you know, so we can help the situation. Today, Charles Retta is helping Ariel get food assistance that has been slow to come. You know, she said she still ain't got her benefits. She eight months pregnant. Now, if she had had the benefits at six months like they were supposed to give them to her, she would have had a $75 to get her low-income housing. Now they put her back on the back of the burn. She still ain't got her benefits. Okay. The coupons going to start today because you missed the month of April. Then they're going to start the 24th okay. to the 30th. You have to go to five different okay. interviews okay. before you get your cash assistance. So it takes a while to get them. Sign these on one side. I don't want to have to have cash benefits for 36 months. I don't want to have to have it for 12 months, but you know, like I want to really depend on myself. But at this time, I do need help. So it's Ariel wants to pursue her education, time, but was told that she wouldn't be eligible for welfare myself. unless she took an unpaid job, even though she's pregnant. It's life for me anyway. It's life, so I have to deal with it. There's no other way around it. A lot of times, programs and stuff, all they care about is numbers. They don't care about people. So I care about people. Care Charles Retta is convinced the system is failing to address the root causes of problems that it was designed to solve. They need the systems they get. Stop cutting these programs that's helping people. If it doesn't change, you're going to see more violence. That's what you're going to see. You're going to see more violence. You're going to see more babies dying. You're going to see more family tragedies. That's what you're going to see. Cleveland hasn't always been the worst city in America for infant mortality. But while the problem at a national level has actually been improving, Cleveland's numbers have been getting worse. 
Cleveland's infant mortality figures are tracked by the city's Department of Health. So we've come here to City Hall to speak to the person in charge and ask what they're doing to address what many here are saying is a crisis facing the city. As Cleveland's public health director, Karen Butler is in charge of pregnancy programs like Moms First that are designed to help pregnant mothers. Despite the success of that program, some argue that it's only reaching a fraction of the population that needs help. Through this Moms First program, we have had tremendous success. In fact, uh, our most recent reports on our infant mortality rate demonstrate uh, that there has been a steady decline in the infant mortality rate of our participant population. The city of Cleveland, if you compare the rates, it's worse than any other U.S. city. Okay, so that's... Do you, were, you, were you aware of that? Not that we were the absolute worst, no. Did you think you were in the bottom five? Um, Cleveland is one of the cities, one of the major large metropolitan cities that has a major issue with infant mortality as well as many of the other health care issues. But if you look at the, the picture of the city, the rates are worse than countries like Albania and Sri Lanka. This is, this I mean, is, that's surely not something you can be proud of. We're not, nor will we indicate that we're proud of our numbers. We're proud of the effort. We're proud of the effort that Clevelanders are putting forth to begin to address those issues. That's good. Thank you. So, so, can I just ask about the women who are falling outside the net? Because yeah, we did this. Thank you very much. After walking out of the interview, we were told that the official wasn't prepared for such specific questions, even though we'd been clear we wanted to speak about infant mortality throughout Cleveland. Well, that was a surprising response to some pretty simple questions. And the interesting thing for me was that not only do the officials here in Cleveland not seem to want to talk about the citywide rate of infant mortality, they also don't even seem to know quite how bad those numbers are. Back in the city's NICUs, the sense of crisis is certainly being felt. Every day, these doctors and nurses are battling to save lives, trying to control a situation they say is increasingly out of their hands. Cleveland's economic struggles, its decayed neighborhoods with their rampant unemployment levels and uneven access to healthcare, have combined to turn the city into America's infant mortality capital. But if that wasn't a perfect enough storm, now, politicians at the state level are considering further cuts to health care. The politicians in Columbus are playing games, to be quite blunt, and, uh, and we may not get literally billions of dollars that we have coming to us, that we're, we're spending the money, but it may not be coming back to us because politicians have decided they want to play politics. If that happens, that'll be disastrous for our state. It'll certainly be disastrous for our hospital, our NICU. This summer, Ohio's state capital, Columbus, was the scene of heated debate over whether or not to expand health care coverage for the working poor. The question is, shall the amendment be agreed upon? Ohio's Republican-controlled legislature turned down $13 billion in extra funding from the federal government for what appeared to be ideological reasons. Uh, I urge the failure of, of this amendment. They even rejected a comparatively small emergency measure aimed at reducing the state's woeful infant mortality rates. We asked for, in this budget, $3.8 million to be targeted where the masses of racial and ethnic minorities live in the state of Ohio, allowing infants to live until their first birthday. Senator Charletta Tavares has been working for years to redress racial health disparities in Ohio. She proposed an amendment to Ohio's budget to fund health programs to specifically reduce infant mortality in minority communities. Every public official will hold up a baby, will talk about how children are our greatest assets, but it seems to some communities, and the community that I represent, that some babies matter more than others. Those opposed say nay. The proposal went nowhere, the majority voting to move ahead without the amendment. I'm for doing well for the poor, 
but you don't do it by making it easy for them to stay in poverty. You have to drive them out, make them uncomfortable in their poverty, and they will do for themselves. They will earn for themselves, and they will be much better off at the end of the day um, when they have earned it on their own versus when they have gotten handouts. But why would politicians in a state clearly in the midst of a crisis with such high numbers of babies dying before their first birthday turn down money that could make a real difference? Uh, I'm Sebastian Walker with Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to see if um, Senator Oboff is available to speak about the Medicaid expansion. You can leave your information, I can ask okay. him about it. Thank you very much. No okay. problem. It's a simple question that many, it seems, didn't want to answer. I mean, we wanted a short conversation with anybody on the Republican side yeah. to talk about yeah. the health disparities. Is there anyone else that's willing to speak to us Not on the Republican side? Thank you. We'd love to talk to him even just for five minutes. Sure. Um, I know he is chalked up for the day, but uh, I'll make sure he gets it. Okay, thanks very much. It's just about infant mortality and the um, health care provisions right. that are being passed. Thank you. All right. Eventually, we did catch up with one of them. Republican State Senator Chris Jordan. Oh, hi. Hey, I'm Sebastian Walker from Al Jazeera. Okay. Nice, nice to meet you. Just on infant mortality in Ohio, are you aware that this is, um, you know, one of the worst states in the country for... I've got a meeting that I'm running late to. Can, can we just very briefly get, get, get your comments on that? I've got a meeting that I'm running late to. Just really briefly, this is one of the worst places in the entire country I've got a for... I've that I told you just, Can we just get, get your position really, really, really quickly, Senator? So, just, just a couple of minutes of your time. Well, we've been trying to get answers from politicians on the other side of the healthcare debate here in Columbus. The one person we found didn't want to answer any of our questions. And with nothing currently on the table to do anything about healthcare disparities here in Ohio, it looks like the state's infant mortality crisis is just going to keep getting worse. We live in a system where racism is still prevalent. And there are stereotypes and caricatures that follow certain groups of people, like low-income, single, black mothers, that you're not doing your best, you're living off the system, you're driving Cadillacs, all this stuff that has no basis in reality. Racism and poverty are intertwined. And I think each makes the other worse but I think racism is the venom in the bite of poverty. I would say to the politicians, okay, to stop thinking about you all yourself, okay? Start thinking about the people who put you in there. Okay, have some empathy for them. Have some sympathy for them. Before leaving Ohio, we went to see one of the mothers we'd met earlier in our time here. Okay, okay. Ariel has just given birth, not to the boy she was expecting, but to a daughter who she's named Samari. Samari was full term, but substantially underweight. She has several birth defects, including a cleft lip and palate. Once I saw her, it made me, you know, like sad, kind of depressed, but it's something that I eventually got over because, I mean, she's going to be here regardless whether her lip gets fixed or not, so, I mean, she's my daughter. She has to be taken care of. It's... Ariel was still homeless and waiting for public housing to come through, but now with a newborn baby to take care of. So what kind of future are you hoping for for Samari? I definitely want her to have a better education, one better education and a better group of people to be around, a better society to live in. I mean, for the time being, we're here, so we make the best of it, but when I definitely get a chance, we definitely move in. Somewhere away from here. Okay.